Star Trek is one of the most loved science fiction franchises of all time. Whatever generation you are, there is a Star Trek show that you grew up watching. Unfortunately for some, that show might be Enterprise. Admittedly, it's not the greatest. Like, it both tries to do too much while not doing enough, but it does have its merits. Connor Trainer as Trip, like, that's it, that's the merit. Okay, but like, seriously, I'm being harsh, I know I am, but making a show that is a precursor to what we already know requires that you set up a backstory to the original series, that you explain the first days of warp travel, you lay the foundations for the United Federation, you create older versions of technology, you introduce aliens we've never seen and never will see again. It's a tall order, and sometimes it's great, sometimes not so much. But in the spirit of embarking on an exploration through the science of Star Trek, we have to start at the start. The earliest star date, that is. And this is Science According to Enterprise. Okay, you look, you guys, in all honesty, I really struggled with how best to summarize the science of this show. Like, do one video, do a series, pick out every bit of science or just some grand themes. I'm still not sure if I'm doing the right thing, but in the interest of just moving on, here we are. Each show will have a series of episodes centered on the main themes that we see that come up in Star Trek time and again from a physics perspective, of course. Uh, space travel technology and weapons, subspace and dimensions, cosmic phenomena, time travel. And I reserve the right as well to have like a final commentary episode, maybe some best bits to pick out or some, you know, oh my God, what were they thinking bits? As we move through the different shows, we'll talk about how each one handles these themes. And if you want me to add anything, speak now. Because between you and me, the sooner we get to move on from Enterprise, the happier I will be. This is episode one, Space Travel. It's warp, like we're talking about warp drive. Warp drive is a faster than light propulsion system that allows for space travel outside of our solar system and across the galaxy. Depending on which show you watch, there are some slightly different views on how warp travel is achieved. Enterprise sits in this kind of funny pocket of being before the original series in the timeline, but being released in the decade after Miguel Alcubierre's paper about warping space time. In 1994, Miguel Alcubierre, a Mexican theoretical physicist, wanted to see if he could describe a warp bubble in a way that would be consistent with general relativity. General relativity suggests that space can be expanded or contracted given the right conditions. Now, Alcubierre's idea is centered around a warp bubble, and then inside this bubble, a spacecraft would sit stationary relative to the space directly around it. So the ship doesn't move, space does. Now this type of warp drive would work by contracting space in front of the bubble and expanding space behind it. This would effectively propel the bubble with the spacecraft inside it faster than light relative to the space outside the bubble. However, inside the bubble, since the ship is stationary relative to its immediate surroundings, it doesn't violate the cosmic speed limit set by the speed of light in a vacuum basically faster than light travel. Now, one of the major criticisms or challenges of Alcubierre's proposal is the energy requirement. So initial estimates suggested that to move a small spacecraft, the energy required would be the equivalent to the mass energy of the entire visible universe. <laughs> Later, refinements to the theory have reduced this, but the energy requirement still remains exceedingly high. We're talking like the order of multiple suns worth of energy. So it's likely unfeasible with our current understanding of physics. Now, another challenge is the type of matter required to create the warp bubble. The theory requires something that's called exotic matter. Now, this basically means something that has a negative energy density in order to be able to form this bubble. As of now, there is no such matter known to exist in the universe. And incidentally, this is the same type of matter that is required in order to create a traversable wormhole. So we've got kind of the same issues no matter what faster than light travel concept we're talking about. The final issue is that there have been some suggestions that a ship traveling in such a warp bubble would accumulate hazardous radiation or particles at the front. 
which would be released in a potentially deadly burst once the ship decelerates. Okay, so warp drive, possible in theory, but in practicality, it's pretty complicated. This hasn't stopped more recent Star Trek shows though from adopting Alcubierre's approach as a way to give a more scientifically accurate depiction of what warp drive is and then find their own ways to solve the issues of energy, radiation accumulation and exotic matter. Now there are a few key episodes in Enterprise that lends to a good description of how this show describes warp but the most detailed one comes in season 1 episode 11 Cold Front. In this episode, they describe the warp core of the NX-01 as a gravimetric field displacement manifold. Now, this is what is responsible for generating the warp bubble around the ship. It's essentially calculating the required gravitational field that would allow for the manipulation of space-time around the ship. The field is then mediated by the warp coils, which are housed in the nacelles. Now, something that needs to be noted here is that they are displacing a subspace field. So it's not gravity of space-time as we know it. Subspace is essentially an alternate region or set of dimensions that exist alongside regular space-time. It's a fictional construct, but it's central to the Star Trek universe, and there are various theories in modern physics that postulate extra dimensions beyond our familiar three dimensions of space and one of time, like in string theory, but these aren't equivalent to the subspace concept in Star Trek. <laughs> Essentially, they're combining the very real theoretical idea of a warp bubble with the very science fiction concept of subspace, which is basically hyperspace. So it sounds like they're generating the bubble to allow them to travel through subspace rather than contract and expand normal space. But where do they get the energy from? The energy to generate a warp bubble comes from a matter-antimatter reaction between deuterium and antideuterium within the warp core. Now, if you didn't already know, antimatter is a very real thing. It's a type of matter that has all the same properties as normal matter, but a different charge. So an electron has a negative charge, and the antiparticle of an electron is a particle that has all the same properties of an electron, but a positive charge. It's called a positron. Positrons are actually used in medical imaging. Have you ever heard of a PET scan? It stands for positron emission tomography. Now when matter and antimatter come into contact, they annihilate each other, producing a vast amount of energy in the process. Annihilation is just the term that we use to say that the collision is converted to pure energy. Like it doesn't create other particles as a byproduct, something that happens in most other particle collisions. So a matter-antimatter collision can produce large amounts of energy. Specifically, they produce energy according to Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. This is where m is the total mass of the matter and antimatter, and c is the speed of light. And this equation tells us that a small amount of mass can be converted into a large amount of energy. Side note, we're talking relativistic here, so it's got to be traveling at the speed of light. So could we use a reaction like this for space travel? Not really. You see, antimatter is difficult to create, difficult to collect, difficult to store. Now, it's made in particle colliders mostly as a byproduct of other collisions, and as the antiparticles are charged, they can then be separated using magnetic and electric fields. And they're stored then in what's called a penning trap. This is the type of trap that employs both electric and magnetic fields to hold the antiparticles in place, preventing them from coming into contact with the walls of the containment device. Now, anti-atoms, which yes, can be made, such as anti-hydrogen atoms, consisting of a positron orbiting an antiproton, these are electrically neutral, so they can't be confined with electric fields. And CERN's alpha experiment, for example, uses a combination of magnetic fields to trap anti-hydrogen atoms and study their properties. So we can create anti-atoms, we can gather antiparticles, we can store them, but the traps have a time limit. They can't contain the particles indefinitely. And the real problem is that we can't really make very much of it. CERN makes about one nanogram of antiprotons per year. Essentially, while a matter-antimatter reaction is clever in terms of energy production, the truth is that for us and our current technology, it costs a lot more energy input to make antimatter than the energy we get out of colliding it with matter. Secondly, 
even to produce one gram of antimatter, that's the equivalent of one hydrogen bomb, would currently take us a billion or so years. So it's not the energy solution we want outside of science fiction. Back to Star Trek. When deuterium and anti-deuterium collide in the warp core, they annihilate each other, producing an immense amount of energy. This energy is then channeled and used to power the ship's warp coils, creating the warp bubble necessary for faster than light travel. The reaction itself is mediated by dilithium crystals. This dilithium is stable at high energy warp reactions and prevents the matter and antimatter from directly annihilating each other, allowing for a controlled and steady release of energy. But dilithium has a secondary use in our warp science story. It's kind of the way Star Trek gets around the need for exotic matter. Now, dilithium is Star Trek's unobtainium, a material that has all the properties you need but just kind of doesn't exist. In Trek lore, dilithium crystals are rare and naturally occurring crystals that act as a regulator or mediator for the matter-antimatter reactions that power the warp engines. Dilithium is unique because it's non-reactive with antimatter when subjected to high-frequency electromagnetic fields. So it's not a substitute for exotic matter, it's just that in the world of Star Trek, exotic matter isn't something that's actually needed. Dilithium crystals are a mediating substance that allows for control over the energy and the creation of a stable warp field. <laughs> Lastly, what about the buildup of energy and particles on the bubble? Enter the navigational deflector shield. Now, in general, a deflector shield is often simply referred to as shields in Star Trek. It's an energy barrier used by starships and other structures to protect them from external threats. These shields can absorb or deflect various types of energy and matter, making them indispensable for ships when they're traveling at warp speed or when they're entering into combat. An interesting point here is that the strength and frequency of the shields can be modulated. So these details are kept away from enemies. And don't forget, you can't use the transporter when the shields are up. The navigational deflector shield pushes aside energy and matter that the bubble encounters as space moves around it, which stops damage to the ship and stops a buildup of energy on the bubble that would potentially destroy anything nearby once the ship comes out of warp. So, we can theoretically create a warp bubble. Star Trek uses matter-antimatter reaction between deuterium and anti-deuterium to create the energy required. It's controlled by dilithium crystals and the ship and space are protected from the buildup of energy and particulates by the navigational deflector shield. As far as I'm concerned, the science of warp according to Enterprise is more science than fiction. See, the show's not that bad. Just don't ever mention this indie. You'll be fine. Won't we? I'm Abby, your pop culture scientist. Thank you for watching. Um, like and like subscribe, follow, do those things if you feel like it and if you want more Star Trek content. Also, if you have recommendations of things you want me to actually talk about in terms of the science of this, please do let me know. Bye now.